Today we're going to uh, just go through a few things and uh, focus the bulk of the time on a working session around our four themes, uh, which I'll talk to you about in a little bit. But just to get started, uh, we like every month to remind everyone of the mission and vision of the coalition. Uh, it's up on the screen. I'm not going to read it to you word for word. Um, but um, we're here as a sharing organization. And while we are going to be orienting our work groups for the possibility of some action oriented projects, we are not set up to dictate or mandate that we opportunity uh, given the, uh, the significance of the issues that are emerging around the country and our role as one of the leading cities. Um, that if we see an opportunity to take action from a coalition standpoint, we want to be in a position to do that. Um, so, um, just by way of some of the uh, logistics of the meeting, I, hopefully you've all seen and had a chance to, to check your name in uh, over on the side and if the name's not on there to write in some of your information. Um, if you have a parking ticket from the garage, which I do, and I'm reminding myself now by sharing this information with you, make sure, sure you see that stunning redhead there with the <laughs> ticket <laughs> stamper to get your ticket stamped and validated before you leave. Um, and uh, for those of you who are, uh, have devices to go online, you see the uh, Wi-Fi network and password if you like. Um, also, uh, as part of our outreach uh, with the coalition, uh, we've got a, a website, we have a Twitter handle, uh, and we have our Facebook page, uh, and we welcome and heartily invite each of you to get on those uh, uh, channels and make sure you're uh, posting and uh, sharing news about what we do here. Uh, also, we'd like to remind everyone we do have a steering council uh, made up of representatives of a number of the organizations here. Um, uh, a number of whom are not here today. Uh, that would include Carrie from the library, Aaron from Casey Duke from Brian Gillian, uh, although Gillian does have Susan Norris here standing in for her. Uh, and uh, I know Dominica is here with me. There's Dominica. Uh, Stephanie is not here today. She's got a board retreat and refresher here with the city. So, um, uh, and we'll have a chance to share with you a bit um, uh, some of the outreach that these members have been able to have recently on a national level, uh, which further helps put the work we're doing here in Kansas City in the spotlight. Um, so, today I'm just going to get through a few things, but uh, I, I want to start off. Uh, with a big, gigantic thank you uh, uh, to Wendy Pearson and Sarah Bell, both of whom here are fellows uh, who put together last month's meeting. Uh, and it was really a well attended and uh, energizing meeting. Uh, you guys did an awesome job, and we continue to give great feedback. You know, uh, not only the, the uh, participation with uh, local community leaders and the chance to get you know, input from uh, the issues they're dealing with uh, that go beyond just the normal faces and voices we hear, but then to tie into a national level, uh, you know, live streaming event. That was really just a super event. It was all part of the celebration of Digital Inclusion Week, which was really uh, participated in and celebrated throughout the country. You guys have done an awesome job, so thank you once again. Um, uh, I want to just give you a personal uh, update on some of the things that have been going on involving uh, national level events where members of our coalition have gotten to play uh, a role not only in attending, but in um, having speaking roles, participating in uh, forums and panels that, uh, like I said, further cast a, a spotlight on what we're doing here. Um, the first one is the, uh, now that I've talked about the May uh, coalition meeting we have here, the second one is at UMKC, oh sorry, I skipped it. Let's talk about the NET Summit. Um, uh, the National Digital Inclusion Alliance had their annual event in St. Paul, Minnesota, 
a little less than two weeks ago. Uh, I know uh, I attended along with Ricky, co-founder of Connected for Good. Uh, we got to speak on different panels. Um, McLean Bryant, uh, policy director for the mayor uh, of Kansas City, Missouri, she was there on the panel. Uh, we had uh, um, great representation. Bob Akers, uh, former director of uh, Surplus Exchange, and now with uh, with the Basel Action Network, he stewards. Uh, he was representing us. Uh, I can keep still with the current and new director of Surplus Exchange is here. Uh, what I want to share with you about that Net Inclusion Summit is we saw participation from, um, from federal government representatives, um, uh, national groups, corporate, um, tech, uh, internet supply uh, providers, um, nonprofits, grassroots organizations, and just interested participants. There were over 250 attendees uh, at an absolutely stunning uh, St. Paul uh, library. Also went around to see places like PCs for People uh, and a lot of other uh, community-based organizations in St. Paul. Uh, it, it was a fabulous event. What it underscored for me is that the dialogue on digital inclusion has definitely gone beyond just the question of access. Uh, we're talking about uh, the whole ecosystem of, of access, of devices, of um, education and training, <laughs> skills development uh, and the necessity for a wide ranging array of organizations, both community organizations, public and private organizations to do this work. So that was really significant. Um, Mountain Connect is a broadband coalition that meets once a year. That event took place a week ago in Keystone, uh, Colorado. Uh, both Terry Coogan and Aaron Deacon spoke on different panels. Both focusing on innovation and um, putting a spotlight on the, the work that the coalition does as one of the more innovative citywide efforts. And in uh, Aaron's case, he spoke on a panel uh, about um, the, the civic aspects of getting you know, both city government and private companies and, uh, and public and uh, nonprofit organizations all coalescing around uh, this issue of broadband access across the city. Uh, that was impressive. And then uh, I'm going to come back to a local event. The UMKC symposium was on uh, it was, uh, down at the Midwest Center on social innovation. Um, and we had a great couple of panels that, um, that we participated in. Um, I know Bill uh, and Crosby and myself uh, were uh, on some panels that focused on how efforts like this group effort, as well as efforts of our individual organizations, um, how they represent uh, a growing emergence uh, and importance of social innovation, meaning um, as, um, you know the whole idea of taking uh, entrepreneurship, which is uh, about really how do you take care of yourself. Um, uh, to a level of reaching out and helping others in the same process. And I think we got uh, you know, a broad swath of participation among a lot of groups, and, and certainly this coalition was well represented. And then the last one up there, SHLB, is referred to as Shelby, it stands for schools, healthcare, libraries, um, and broadband. Uh, what, you know, what is it that links schools, healthcare organizations, and libraries around the whole idea of broadband connectivity? It's actually an event that's going on right now. Um, Carrie Coogan and Cross the Temple from the library are there. Uh, and I think Aaron Deacon is there as well. Um, but, but again, we are, we are viewed as uh, one of the leading cities in this movement. I know Crosby Kemper got to have a second meeting within the last month with the chairman of the FCC uh, and it's uh, helping to ensure the Kansas City voice is heard on discussions uh, about net neutrality uh, and other privacy issues, as well as support for programs like Lifeline. So, all that being said, we've got a lot going on, uh, both at a local level and at a national spotlight level, and I wanted to make sure you're all aware of that. 
Um, I'm going to um, end my comments here, but uh, not before I uh, introduce Rick Usher, the Assistant City Manager from City of Kansas, Missouri. Rick's going to go through uh, a couple of topics um, that are emerging here in the city uh, uh, and involve the entire community. And when he's done, we're going to be breaking into uh, working sessions. Um, oh, sorry, I didn't steal your thunder. I thought we had a slide up there. Um, about the actual working sessions. But um, hopefully you all recall the four themes that the coalition kind of coalesces around, uh, overcoming barriers, broadening participation, raising awareness, and what's the fourth one that I'm forgetting? Um, here we go. Help me out. Uh, raising awareness, broadening participation, uh, overcoming barriers, and I'll think of it soon. Um, and we have representatives uh, uh, from the steering council who are going to break us into four working groups to try and carry on the work that we did in the meeting before the last meeting. So uh, we'll come to that after Rick's done, but for now, I'm going to introduce Rick Usher. Thanks, good morning. I'm uh, Rick Usher with the city manager's office. And uh, I wanted to introduce the additional scholars we have coming on at the city here in a few weeks. And I don't know if I'm very clear. Eleanor, uh, Nash, and uh, Noah Danner. Uh, but they're, they're high school kids, and they're all not having fun. I'm not telling you, I'm going to start hanging out with them. Um, the, the program, the project that um, we're going to work on during the, we have six weeks. Um, of this, uh, this program. They're, they're hired through the higher PCU program. Uh, a lot of organizations in the room are, are using the uh, uh, kids this summer, employing kids this summer through that program. You have eight kids, is that where was We going? have four from higher PCU, and then we've got a couple of them from Casey Scholars and some other employers that come along from higher PCU. So it's a great way to bring uh, uh, young people into these programs, start raising memories, and getting their, their feedback and input. So through um, our community uh, life strategic plan was adopted by the city council back in uh, April. Uh, one of the uh, projects we have in there is this concept of a community awareness center network. And the, the idea there is that if, if kids in the school district don't have internet access at home, if we want to make sure they have internet access at a public space within say a three to five block block of the inner residence. So we know that the library has uh, learning centers with computer access, the city has community centers, ten community centers with computers available. Our connected uh, for doing has built quite a number, 82, I think it's a number of uh, community learning centers, some public, some not maybe necessarily open to the public. And then uh, the Boy Learning Center has two Community learning centers that they've built in cooperation with some of their partners. Um, so, what, what our additional scholars will be doing is this kind of a current state assessment. They're going to interview, um, say, all of us in the room here. They're going to find out where these public access spaces are available and just do an inventory. Well, what kind of computers do they have? What are their hours? Um, what other services are available there? Is there inventory available? Um, what comes up on the desktop when you turn that computer on? Are there easy resources for our kids to access to complete homework assignments? That, that kind of thing. And then through that work, um, we'll, we'll have this inventory. We'll have uh, hopefully some recommendations that they'll pick up from these organizations as they're interviewing them. Um, we also have uh, MKC's Office of uh, Digital Inclusion, Bill Worcester, and Bill, thank you here. Um, they're, I think, going to ramp up some of their efforts at the same time. So we might have them engage with um, our digital scholars and um, basically treat this like a lot of projects we've had going on with MPC Law School for some time, where we you know, do a relay with different projects. So this assessment will then be passed on to the next group that might then figure out how to fund these things, how to um, establish standards for the computers that are used in these centers, or how to 
build an online community's learning center that would you know, help serve um, uh, these kids. So that's, that's basically what's happening with um, the community learning center piece. I would hope by uh, maybe our September meeting we have a report on that. And uh, you know, I'll move on to the uh, exact and most such question. Um, <clears throat> You know, one of the lessons learned from the interdisciplinary work at UMBC uh, is that <clears throat> oftentimes we, we start the semester with one end in mind, and as we find out the challenges, um, you end up having to do a certain amount of pivoting. So I guess my question is, is do you have written down somewhere a, a sort of a description or a protocol that, that we can, you know, kind of be analyzing as we go along in terms of how we launch these things? And, how will they turn out? <clears throat> Have been able to do that, or is that going to be kind of a mentoring and coaching? Thing? Yeah, and, and that's that's a good point. In, in the years that we've had projects with, um, had projects at Rockford, had projects at UMKC, um, that that is the biggest challenge: is identifying the project the students can complete in a semester. In the case of the university, or in this case, a six-week project. So I have drafted uh, an outline of what I'm hoping they can accomplish, um, and then we can continue to work on the next steps to that. But we've had uh, some meetings with, with uh, the library, with Crosby, with Terry, on other the extensions of this, the next steps of this that will come about uh, this fall. Um, any other questions on that? So if, if you're interested in that, you know, send me an email or let me touch base. I have a list right now of groups that I think that they should talk to, and if you're familiar with more resources that might be available, just let us know. We're hoping to have yeah, something, a product at the end of that six weeks that we can use productively um, when the point is called. Okay, well, I want to just throw something in, because it actually links the, the discussion about community learning centers and identifying them, particularly. It actually links to what Rick's going to talk about next, which is this mapping um, um, kind of tool. And the reason I say that is, um, and you might recall some of the comments I made about what's happening at these national level conferences on, on digital inclusion. Well, when the topic of digital inclusion comes up so far, it's, it's all focused on just broadband access. And so that is becoming kind of an underpinning of all the discussions around digital inclusion. Um, for us in Kansas City, the, the identification of community learning centers gives us, I think, mean, a really unique opportunity because it goes beyond, it'll go beyond just places where people can go to get access to the internet. I mean, it's a great foundation. But I'll just remind everybody that a big project that's kind of starting to grow is one that I know Crosby Kemper has a, a big passion for, and it's the idea of creating some consistency of learning resources and tools and things that people, people can access across off this network of places where they can get internet access. And they can even use what's being developed as a power card, um, where we can start tracking, uh, particularly for low to mid uh, in middle income uh, neighborhood residents where and how they're starting to access these services and these tools. And, um, and so we'll be able to start getting data that can start showcasing how um, identifying a broad network of places where you can get access to the internet, how it actually results in people getting their learning resources, and hopefully showcasing both educational and employment. And then, Tom, the other thing key to this being a network is that those operators of these centers then will have a way to communicate among each other. And um, as we identify, say, where a library like Johnson County Library has an interest space, um, Crosby's developing a community learning center, uh, I'm sorry, what do they call it? Digital Media Lab. And they've got the mobile digital media lab now, but they're just expansion work at Southeast Library. Um, we can develop a, a website then that would show where all these resources are. So if you have a specific interest in a need, you can go to a learning center that, that uh, can help you do that. Yeah. But at some point, you have to have a network architecture. Okay? And one of the things we're going to be doing 
this summer after three years with the, the law and technology and public policy course is a specific assessment of what have we learned. We've had a lot of experiences um, <clears throat> where we're really at the point where we kind of need to sort. Now, <clears throat> get more formalized about it, you're going to you know, give students a semester's worth of work that you want to turn into three or four semesters where you get some real outcomes. <clears throat> At some point, there has to be some sort of traditional planning and structure, uh, and, and that costs. And I, <clears throat> while I think that, that these experiments are uh, can be valuable, at some point, the number of them demands that they be put into a real architecture. And so uh, I, I really want to say that at this point, <clears throat> I almost think that perhaps we need a working group on, on architecture of experiment. I mean, there's a bunch of things you can call it. You know, random experiments that end up having the effect of canceling each other out might look great on a list of achievements, but for the end user, they are annoying because you're doing the same thing over and over again. So we've got a challenge there. That I hope we can figure out a way to step up. Okay, so the <coughs> next uh, next item on the agenda is this um, mapping effort we put together. Uh, Bob Bennett, our, our chief innovation officer at the city, and he's uh, back here. Uh, Bob's been working on the smart city initiatives for a while now. We've got Exact uh, as one of our uh, data visualization uh, startups or companies that we've been working with, and um, they did a. Uh, live data visualization for the uh, smart city initiative being deployed in the streetcar network. So you can look at that map and see uh, what traffic counts are at different intersections, where the streetcars are located, um, there's pedestrian counts, there's uh, parking space monitoring, things like, like that that are going on. But we're in, in the digital equity plan, the smart city efforts, where we're trying to sync those up so that um, we're not you know, broadening the digital divide by excluding parts of the city from both Smart City and, and, and digital equity. So this is um, just the, the very beginning of this map. So there's, you know, we're looking for more input on more information that might be shown on this. But what we have are um, right now data sets from the FCC uh, where internet service providers report their fastest upload download speed by census tract. That's identified here. Uh, census Bureau data on poverty, again by census tract throughout the city. And um, the yellow dots are real-time locations of KCATA buses. And the purple dots are real-time locations. You watch these, they move. Uh, real time locations of the Kent City streetcar. Um, the, the logic behind throwing these things together is that um, in our economically distressed neighborhoods, we found through um, Prospect Max work and through other smart city work we've been doing that these residents are smartphone dependent for internet access and they're transit dependent to get to work and job, uh, education. Uh, other opportunities in the region. So um, those are some things we'll expand on from this. Uh, we've also uh, just an article in GovTech about cross-departmental collaboration on digital inclusion. We're working with our health department to put some health data up here. But what we know in city government is that a, a majority of our resources across the health, city planning, uh, neighborhood and community services, our housing programs are focusing on the same neighborhoods. And our digital equity plan, we put that on there as well, that we're, we're hoping to see that digital equity and connectivity is, is foundational to transforming these neighborhoods. So what this map shows you, it's got uh, a tab here where you can pick a provider and see what that provider is reporting as their network speeds around the city. Uh, this is AT&T, and we move the cursor. Now we have a pointer, but you can see in the table, max download six, uh, max upload one. And then it also, as you tab, it shows Google Sky Gigabit here, Time Warner. Now Spectrum is uh, showing 300 downloads max and 20 um, uploads max available. 
uh, and it shows uh, the poverty rates and in some cases block populations. So that first line is block population, this one says 53, poverty rate is 0.48, so it's one of our economically distressed neighborhoods. And uh, let's see, you can also you know, get, say just, just time Warner, see their network. So the color coding uh, on the table here, the uh, yellow is uh, the 6 to 24 megabit per second. These are the download speeds uh, in, the, in the table. And then we, we broke it off at uh, 25. This 25 is the definition of broadband that the FCC has adopted uh, as, as far as basic, what basic internet ought to be. And then uh, we've got over, we've got 500 plus that will, will show up. So in this case, this is Time Warner's deployment. They can see a pretty pretty good deployment. I haven't seen any areas that are, say, under uh, 100, 200 download speeds, typically 300 download speeds, 20 upload speeds that are available, which is pretty robust given the speed for um, residents. But, you know, to what extent does this reflect the uh, Time Warner Spectrum wireless uh, add-on to the to the wired connectivity. In other words, do we have all of the wireless layers here? No, that, that would be a layer we need to try to find and look at. But right now, this is um, so the reporting to the FCC is only wired. Which is normal. from what we're displaying here now. There's also an FCC table uh, data set that shows adoption by census tract, we're going to put that one up here, uh, where you know subscriptions are being reported. It, it's not household by household, but it is census tract data. Um, and, and, but it doesn't include wireless. We do know through the research we're doing that more and more residents are relying on uh, wireless plans, wireless data plans to serve their home internet needs. So that, that was something that might not show up. For sure, yeah, I have a question. Um, so the piece that we're showing on the map are supported by the ISP. Right. And and we we're not looking at if the households have internet access or not. We're looking at if there's infrastructure. Right? Right so now this problem. is simply a map. This yeah. is showing where the infrastructure yeah. is built. So we don't know if the neighborhoods have act, are actually using these. Right. Okay, so I, I want to make sure. Right, and um, so the other data set I talked about, the connectivity, I'm not sure what they call that data set, but it shows adoption by census tract. Okay. So um, can you tell us like why did you start to decide to look at poverty and speed? Um, what would like to put on this map? I'm sorry. Yes, I'm sorry. Did you Um Well, okay, so what we found, say, you know, uh, uh, the program at t has out, or at t I think it's called Connect, where they're offering three megabit per second uh, internet for $5 or $10 a month. Um, those, there's, there's some actual testing done. So this is also showing maximum advertised speeds. It's not showing actual delivery speeds. Yes. And uh, I don't know if Tom has any experience in this yet in Kansas City, but in Cleveland, the, group that was working to sign residents up for that program were claiming that actual delivered speeds were much, much lower, like less than one megabit per second that was capable of being delivered by the technology that they had in place. So that's what you want to measure? So we want to start with what do we say we have. Um, I think there might be a project going on at um, KC Digital Drive or uh, uh, Code for KC to create a database where residents can report their actual delivery speed by provider. Um, but poverty, of course, is picked because we know that 
that's the audience of residents that are least likely to be connected. Um, yeah, price, I relevance, and, and so it also, these tools are to help us focus where we're addressing our efforts. And so, you know, we want to be able to identify <laughs> gaps, you know, one in uh, availability of broadband. So I think what we have in Kansas City is good availability of broadband at a, at a number of uh, speeds and capabilities. So we've got pretty robust, um, that's kind of an understatement, with, with gigabit internet going in through um, Google, practically citywide, and with AT&T doing that, um, with, with the solid um, so supply of, of uh, good speed internet through exceeding with the broadband publication at 25 megabits per second, um, it, it's going well. So I, I just, I, I just want to um, put a little input in this. Because I, uh, Rick mentioned to me about connected to good, and I have been asked as a leader of a community nonprofit that serves urban core areas that fall within what we call the digital divide to kind of sponsor maps like this. I'm, I'm here to tell you that the reason these maps exist showing poverty versus downward speeds is, um, I believe, merely to showcase the reality of where access is currently available for neighborhoods based on the income status of those neighborhoods. It is not our intention to get involved in the political discussions about right or wrong. There are business issues involved in where infrastructure is in place. And we do believe that having access to this information helps to highlight where there is need to, um, to have a broad range of solutions to help families get access to the internet. Um, and, and I think that the, the very term digital inclusion is designed to uh, make sure that there's some equitable access to, uh, to broadband. Uh, outside of that, uh, I never wanted Connecting for Good or any particular organization to be in a position to say we're endorsing this visible comparison between poverty and speed. But just knowing that, that we now have tools to showcase that, it does help target some of our efforts to make sure that we're getting to so most information about the broadest array of options available to some of these neighbors. So talk about the target, because I understand that at a 10,000 foot level, when I get my design thinking hat on, yeah. I ask myself, who is this representation empathizing with? Who, who are the folks that will benefit or will be moved to some kind of action or at least have their eyes open wider by looking at this particular intersection say as opposed to a whole bunch of other maps that you can get off the you know mark website about poverty and health and dying early which we know are going to correlate with how well people are able to use digital access but in fact there are no correlation with the fact that we can string infrastructure so who's the audience because if we're not thinking about the audience then we can create pictures and tell the cows from that right so the audience is <coughs> The, the really the, the broader community and and uh, you know our, our city council, but also the corporate community, the business community, I think it's significant to show that digital inclusion efforts are workforce development efforts, their job creation, their small business creation efforts, and we pair those with, uh, like I mentioned, higher case of youth, tech hire, launch code. And other other things we've got going on in the startup and the entrepreneur community, we have a full spectrum pretty well served to take someone from being really at home with no knowledge to being able to develop tech skills or other job skills and they can get employment at home through um, the internet. This this is again built just the, the beginning of the conversation because. We are going to put that health department data on here. The thing about data visualizations is, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words, but a data visualization like this is worth nearly ten thousand. What's the evidence for that? I mean, I read that in the, in the report on startling news 
And frankly, I, this is overwhelming. It, it, as a user experience, the, it's, it's one of the worst I have seen for a graphic of this type. Well, thanks for that. Well, <laughs> so, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you the next day, Norris is and I want to know what is important of us coming to this meeting if all we're going to hear is hear something a small group of people we don't know about is doing that they think is the right thing to do. And then I go and I look at Casey Rising, and I cannot find one shred of evidence that they recognize that digital inclusion is even an issue. And you told me that's right. the audience. Right. Now we have to get serious about this. This is, uh, you know, baby steps, Bill. Well, we've been doing baby steps for five years. And we're going in a circle. So, so you have a question? Uh, just one thought, sorry. Working for Century Link, the wire provider, we use this data to determine where we were going to build fiber in 10 cities around the nation. They use this. Now, I hated it because I did the business cases on those. And, you know, we, we got to decide whether we're going to build this neighborhood or that neighborhood. Well, guess what? Which neighborhood did we not build it either? We had all the demographic information, we had that type of information. We didn't go to the poverty neighborhood. But you know what? If that's this the information is used by Verizon, it's used by uh, Centrally Call. residents because by having crappy internet in your neighborhood you're not able to take advantage of these internet experiences and it's still for some of these neighborhoods but for google and to a certain extent time order you you've got crappy internet and you might as well go to the library and try to use something faster so yeah you know, but they're all trying to get to how do you get them all fired now right yeah, 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 so the right yeah. benefit we have in Kansas City is we have that opportunity to show to other cities why that investment is significant. With them. one provider, and it would be great if all three for that, we would be starting to compete on service and other things. That would well, and we have AT&T, but if you look at the maps closely, they're building their data grid in those um, more affluent neighborhoods. But there are also fiber and copper, and they yeah. haven't figured out how to get rid of the copper to take, make it all fiber. That's right. Let me let me keep us going just for the sake of argument. Question, yeah. question, yeah. question, yeah. question yeah. had a, a comment. Sorry. Right. I, I didn't you sure? Thank you, Rick, for sharing this because I do find it useful. You're right. We do use this information. I think this is comes more useful as we get into the weeds of the data that we have to do this work. And I'm not sure that it is more useful than just sort of looking at the still emerging, um, not only locally, but around the country. So the more we can do to provide tools that give different people different ways of recognizing of the variety of issues involved in the country, I think it's nothing but a good thing. Rick, you wanted to make a comment. Yeah, I just wanted to, a couple of weeks ago up, up in St. Paul, I attended one of the workshops up there. That one of the things they were talking about, and this is actually really encouraging, is there's a watchdog group out of D.C. that was reporting that they were noticing uh, infrastructure investment from the ISPs nationally. They were kind of cherry picking where they were investing, and they were only investing in infrastructure in the areas that made money. <coughs> the urban core was not being invested in, at least at the same rate as the other areas. Uh, so when I look at this and I see that most of the urban core has 200 megabytes of uh, infrastructure available or gigabits, um, it's actually really encouraging because that tells us, that tells me that Kansas City is definitely ahead of the curve um, nationally in that effort. 
Right, and so for the community and those in our digital equity plan, we have a, a concept that um, FCC Chairman Richard Pai put out there, Gated Opportunity Zones. We now know that those urban neighborhoods that have gated speed internet available, and we can work with residents and property owners to uh, show them that the opportunities are available. And that's so, I mean, it's great to have discussion and debate. That's, to me, as one reason we exist. So, we're not trying to have anybody not provide input and discussion. What we want to break into, though, is what can we as a coalition do to further expand uh, around four themes that this group, along with a lot of input from the community helps us determine our four major themes that we're going after. I don't have a slide to showcase it, but we have, oh, did it? Yeah. So just real quick. Oh, um, God, yeah. We have a, uh, a digital inclusion community awareness. We have a slide. Uh, information day. Oh, good. Okay. Okay. There you go. Yeah, so this is a digital inclusion community awareness day, Saturday, June 7th, 9 to noon at Morningstar uh, Youth and Family Life Center, 2525 East 27th Street. Um, the mayor. Um, Mike, the agenda says all the things. Wait, July. July 15th. July 17th. It's on your agenda. Sorry, no, 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 it's not a Saturday. July 15th. July 15th. It's a Saturday. It's a Saturday. So, you know, Saturday, July 15th. We're all going to put on a slide. So, yeah, it's July 15th, Saturday, 9 to noon. Uh, we'll have a, a, a panel discussion on roads and resources and then a uh, resource fair where uh, uh, some of our ISPs will be there to help residents figure out what plans will work for them. Um, we'll have other organizations there. We're, we're wrapping off three computers, wrapping off a couple computers, right? And uh, so that's, that's again coming in July. Are you planning to send information to the people that you would like to? Yes, to yes. So on that note, uh, yeah. we have a, because we, we uh, Obviously, we're trying to find those residents who are not online, so the social media is not really going to help get their attention. We're doing a water bill insert that's going to be start going out in the mail here um, in the next week, uh, week or so, and, and that will go out citywide. I'm meeting like you mentioned ISPs. We got them formally invited to participate. Yeah. yeah. All right, well, all right, we're so, <coughs> yeah, I thought that we could block everybody in, but uh, yeah, I saw a lot of uh, folks say that they're going to be So we'll, we'll get that locked down. Um, and then Morningstar Family Life Center, as I was talking about um, community learning centers earlier, this is a, a great success story that we had with um, Surplus Exchange. Uh, you're still there, Dan, right? Yeah. Uh, walking through the new facility with Pastor Miles uh, back in October, about right, September. Yes, yeah, seems right. Um, checking out the facility, um, their the room labeled computer lab, and it was empty. <coughs> and so I said, "Well, Pastor, where are the computers?" And he said, "Well, uh, can you help me out?" And I said, "Of course." <laughs> so I called Bob, and then uh, Bob sent his crew out. They not only provided 19 refurbished uh, PCs, desktop PCs, but furniture. And then they also reworked the cabling, the Wi-Fi in the building, and maximize uh, the capability they had on that site. And now, um, Pastor Miles has expanded on that. He's got after-school programs. Uh, right across the street is the Kansas City Police Department's East Patrol. East Patrol has a computer lab, and they're Partnering with Morningstar to run those classes for kids there, the computers are being used for kids there. So, early examples of a, what we hope to achieve through a broader community learning center network. Okay. Okay. So, um, thank you, Rick. Uh, that's a lot of 
a lot of information, a lot of activity happening in our city. Um, and so involvement is the name of the game um, because we, we know that as we get more involved, both within our, our organizations that we work with as well as through cross-fertilizing, we're going to move the needle in more positive directions. We have four themes that we're coalescing around, I mentioned before, and we have uh, we're going to break into about a 30-minute work session uh, with representatives of each of the four themes, and I remember the fourth one now. So, uh, but I don't know who's representing which group. The group that I um, forgot earlier is, is called Connecting People. Is there a series of council members here representing that group? I know Dave Patron uh, uh, was running that group. So if, if there's not, if there's no one representing the theme connecting people, uh, I want you to keep that in mind. I'm just going to hold it out here, and I may have some people um, get together around the table around that theme. But otherwise, there are three other themes. One that I'm leading is a group on raising awareness. So if you're if you were involved in a prior group with me, or if you're interested and helping us identify issues that may turn into a coalition project around raising awareness of digital inclusion. That's going to be my group. There's one around overcoming barriers, overcoming barriers to digital inclusion and, and getting more people throughout the city involved. Susan Norris. Oh, and, uh, and John um, uh, from uh, Literacy KC um, are going to be running uh, that particular group that's Jillian Helm, who's a member of our steering committee, that's her group, and John and Susan are, are standing in on her behalf. Thank you for that. And then um, uh, the fourth group is broadening participation. And Rick, is that your uh, yep. is that your group? Yep. So if, Did we, if you have yeah. I'm going to do introductions then as well, because oh, okay. on that I've got some guests. Okay, Go okay. Ahead. Before we break into the groups, we're going to have four working groups around those four themes. Connecting people, overcoming barriers, raising awareness, and broadening participation. We're just asking you to pick one of those four groups, um, and we're going to get some input on some things that are happening in your organizations that might represent some common themes that could turn into a coalition project. Before we do that, we'd like to do a quick round robin, give everybody a chance to stand up and just say your name, your organization you represent, um, and make sure everybody here has a chance to know who's representing. Okay? So I'm going to start up here at this table. Neil, if you want to get us going. Hi, Neil Gill with the Spectrum for our Government Affairs Community in Dayton. Rick Dean, Jason Forget, Mark Banner, just here representing myself. Community Action Agency's Weatherization Department. Lamar Holman, Community Action Agency Weatherization. Oh, and by the way, there's, you want to give a little plug for uh, Mind Health Weatherization? Sure. Our kids sure. Right now. I appreciate that. Um, if you're not familiar with the program, we do represent Jackson, Clay, and Clack, uh, Clack counties. We provide weatherization for income eligible residents, uh, whether they're homeowners or renters. The good news is that our energy auditors actually go into the home. Now they spend about three hours performing an assessment. It's pretty extensive, very comprehensive. We look at every uh, inch of that home. Uh, and uh, after three hours of collecting data, we'll go back to our uh, offices and create a work scope. Uh, we typically spend anywhere from seven to $12,000 on a home for improvements to make the home more energy efficient. And it costs nothing for the homeowner or the renter. So if you'd like to know some more information, I'd be happy to share it with you. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Mark. And just in the spirit of, of some of the uh, policy priorities and action themes that are part of the city's digital equity strategic plan, and through uh, Rick Usher's efforts, we are uh, attempting to integrate uh, learning about or knowledge about uh, whether homes have broadband internet access as part of this uh, program. So that's one of the uh, great accomplishments, I think, that resulted from having that digital equity strategic plan at the city. So thank you. You want to go to this table back there? Okay. Okay. Christine Folk, Connecting for Good, Healthy Learning and Connecting for Good. Sarah Bell, Voters Community, Wendy Pierce, KC Public Library. Sarah Wagner, KC Public Library. Uh, Nick Valdez, a public library. Rachel Merlin, 
Physical Fiber. Coco Lost on Physical Fiber. Robert Mandel and Coco Lost. Uh, Randy Barclay, I currently work for Sprint, but I represent myself. Carol Lamb, the Institute of Black Invention and Technology. Tracy Rowland, the University of Missouri Health Department. Oliver Burnett, uh, Director of Development and Habitat for Humanity. Bob Bennett, uh, City of Kansas City, uh, Office of Innovation. Susan Norris, I was the one making sure you get the to take care. John Teasdale, the nurse in KC. Um, Lucia Biker, I'm a doctoral student at Columbia University. Bill Mullins, UE. Quest, with project and not a knowledge. <laughs> Gabrielle Smith, literacy team. Tina. Oh, <laughs> Tina Kerstelik with Surplus Exchange. Bob Akers, Basel Actor Network Key Stewards. Rick Usher, City Manager's Office. Domingo Levin, Metropolitan Community College, and I actually am sharing the connecting people. Yeah. Sure about that. Okay. All right, so um, it's 11.30. Uh, we hope that um, you all will uh, be willing and able to stick with us for another 30 minutes. Uh, don't forget about getting your parking ticket validated with Wendy, but uh, in the meantime, uh, let's coalesce around the groups. The main 11 is running the Connecting People theme. Rick Usher, uh, one of them will probably move to a different table, is doing broadening participation. John Teasdale, uh, Susan Norris are going to be doing Overcoming Barriers, one of those tables back there. And I'm going to occupy one of these two tables up here to talk about raising awareness. All right, thank you all uh, in advance for coming. Uh, you're, you're, you're free to leave. Uh, when you're